All right. Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Boykman. I'm an AmeriCorps member with Chagrin River Watershed Partners. And just to heads up, we are recording this webinar. So if you, you can't, um, you can rewatch it at any time if you feel the need so. Or if you know somebody that wasn't able to attend, you they can attend. So we'll be sharing that on our website as well as Chagrin River Watershed Partners YouTube channel. Um, also there, you can also check out the past uh, speaker series. And at the end, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, and you can ask, yeah, ask questions at any time in the question area while the, present, the presentation is going on. And today we are joined by Tom Macy. Tom has been the Forest Health Program Manager uh, for ODNR, Division of Forestry, since 2013. And in this role, he coordinates and monitors and surveying and manages uh, various insects, diseases, and in, uh, invasive species pests affecting o forests in Ohio as well as education and outreach. He has earned his bachelor's and master's in forestry science from Ohio State. All right, Tom, it is all you. Great, cool. Well, um, thanks a lot, Heather, for the invite and thank you everyone for tuning in to, uh, to get an update here on some uh, invasive insect and disease pests affecting forests in northeastern Ohio. Um, so as as Heather uh, introduced me there, I work for Ohio DNR Division of Forestry. Uh, I manage our forest health program. I work out of our central office in Columbus, um, but we do work statewide and do a lot of um, survey and monitoring for invasive uh, insect pests that impact forests in the state. So um, I am going to jump right in here. I'm going to use this um, laser pointer. I think y'all can see that just uh, to point things out on the slides here. So, okay. So the goal of our forest health program within ODNR Division of Forestry is to monitor, eradicate, and suppress forest pests, as well as conduct outreach and education to increase awareness and knowledge of forest pest issues within the state. Um, we, the Division of Forestry is a smaller division within ODNR, we're around 100 staff. And within that, our forest health program is quite small, only um, really myself, three full-time uh, forest health foresters, and a handful of uh, interns and uh, kind of seasonal intermittent staff. So we've got a pretty small staff and a lot to work on. Ohio's a big state. So to accomplish that mission, we rely quite a bit on other partner agencies. And these are just a few listed here that we work with pretty regularly. Um, we get a lot of our funding from um, the US Forest Service uh, and we, we partner with others around the state. And, um, and yeah, the education and outreach piece is huge in my in my opinion. Um, so a little bit of an outline of, of what I'll cover today. Uh, biology identification and management of invasive forest pests. I'm going to focus on beech leaf disease, hemlock woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale, oak wilt, and spotted lanternfly. And you know, with any invasive pest, the, the important thing is early detection and rapid response. Um, sometimes you'll see that acronym EDRR, and that's, that's real important because um, the sooner we identify and recognize an invasive species in a new area, um, the quicker we can uh, implement management or suppression to either eradicate or suppress the population of that pest and minimize the damage that it causes. So, you know, for that reason, because we're such a small staff, uh, I see this 
education and outreach piece as critical to what we do because that uh, increases the amount of people that are outside among trees and forests and that can recognize these invasive species and uh, report them and we can implement management quicker. So thank you very much for being here and learning about these invasives. Um, so all of these uh, species that I'll be talking about today are currently known to be present in northeastern Ohio. So you could certainly encounter these when you're out and about. Um, and if you do, uh, we'd be interested in, in knowing where you found them. So I'll talk a little bit too about how to recognize them and how to report them. So I'm gonna start off with beech leaf disease. Um, so this is a relatively new issue uh, that was first noticed in 2012 in Northeastern Ohio. Um, there's a, a biologist with Lake County Metro Parks that was first noticing this and um, alerted us to it and the US Forest Service and other folks. And um, you know, we went up there to investigate and try to figure out what it was. This is a, a weird one in terms of forest pests. So it took quite a while to figure out what was going on here. But um, these are the, the symptoms of beech leaf disease on, as you might expect, the leaves of beech trees um, that we see. And so those early symptoms are kind of those uh, dark stripes or bands um, that you see between the lateral leaf veins of the leaf. And this is, uh, I would say, most noticeable when you're looking upwards uh, at branches that are backlit um, by the sky or by the sunlight. Um, those, those striping symptoms become a lot more apparent. Uh, and then the more advanced symptoms, you can see some of these leaves here um, are almost entirely darkened uh, and sort of shriveled and the leaf tissue is thickened or leathery. Um, and then eventually you get um, just not much leaf production at all and a more sparse canopy on the trees and a lot more sunlight coming into the stand versus what you would have with uh, a stand of healthy beech trees. Um, where is this issue occurring? So this is the most recent um, distribution map of where beech leaf disease is known to occur. Um, so we can see here the in 2012 was the first detection in Lake County, um, east of Cleveland. And since that time, it's, it's really being detected across a pretty wide area of multiple states uh, in the east and northeast, including um, up into Ontario, Canada. And so, um, you know, we are, we're doing survey for this statewide, but at this time we've only um, detected it in the northeastern quarter, basically, of the state. And here most recently um, out at a state nature preserve uh, called Gall Woods in northwestern Ohio. So it is, it is on the move. Um, and we still have a lot of unanswered questions and a lot to learn about this and, and how it's moving around. Maybe there was actually multiple introductions of this um, and not necessarily only just spread from Lake County, um, but we're, we're still trying to learn a lot. So there's a lot of ongoing research about this. Um, what damage is it doing? So, you know, the beach leaf disease is definitely uh, causing mortality and death of young beech trees and saplings in forest understories. Um, now, the large overstory canopy trees, um, we're not seeing quite as much complete mortality from beech leaf disease, at least yet, as we are in the small understory trees, um, but that may just need more time for those trees to finally um, succumb to it. But uh, a lot of uh, mature trees like this one pictured on the right um, are pretty heavily impacted and, um, and, and under a lot of stress. And um, so, so yeah, we're, we're certainly monitoring and watching that, but it definitely is causing understory mortality um, and having, having impacts to overstory trees as well. This is a photo um, from the Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, they have a, a 
network of long-term vegetation monitoring plots. Um, and part of that monitoring plot protocol is taking photos of the plot. So this, this plot photo on the left was taken in 2011, before we even knew about beech leaf disease um, being a thing. And then five years later, after the arrival of beech leaf disease, a photo of the same plot, and you can see um, just how damaged the, the foliage is on those beech trees there and how much reduced leaf cover there is. So as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of agencies and organizations that are involved in trying to learn about beech leaf disease. Um, there's a, a list of some of the agencies and organizations active in Ohio with it. Um, we have since learned, since 2012, um, that it appears to be a nematode or a microscopic worm uh, that is causing these symptoms in the leaves. So there is a, a paper that I cited there from 2020 um, where they uh, successfully inoculated um, healthy uninfected buds in a, a sterile greenhouse environment with nematodes and when that bud leafed out they had symptoms of beech leaf disease um, and interestingly in uh, 2019 there was a paper published in Japan that described uh, a new species of nematode that they found on Japanese beach and uh, the photos of the damage that it causes on Japanese beech trees is very similar to what we see uh, here in Ohio and, and North America. And genetic analysis has confirmed that it is the same species that we have here as what they described in Japan. Um, there were some very slight morphological differences that um, led to the nematode we have here being called a separate subspecies. Um, but it is the same species. So uh, that's not a definitive confirmation, but it looks pretty uh, pretty clear that this nematode is probably native um, to Japan. Um, and it, it, it doesn't cause a lot of damage to Japanese beach over in Japan, um, but it certainly does here to uh, American beach. And interestingly, um, there are some other non-native beach species that have been planted here in Ohio, like European beech and Chinese beech um, that are growing at Holden Arboretum and some other places. And they are also showing pretty similar damage to what we're seeing on American beech. So it seems that maybe this nematode is native and co-evolved with Japanese beech, but not the other beech species because of the damage that it's causing to them. Um, so these are some photos of the nematodes. This is These are from Dr. Lynn Carta, who's a nematologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. So she was very helpful early on in learning about these nematodes. But uh, yeah, can't see them with the naked eye. They are microscopic. Um, and these are just some, some good photos that she got of what those nematodes look like. And they live within that leaf tissue. Um, so here's some of the, the efforts that we currently have um, ongoing for beech leaf disease. We kind of have three main projects. The first is to assess the spatial distribution of the nematode. Um, doesn't have a common name at this point, but the genus or the species name is Little Lancus crenate. Um, increasing our detection survey of beech leaf disease across the state and uh, establishing and um, measuring long-term beech leaf disease monitoring plots. So we do have an ongoing project for this uh, assessing the spatial distribution in partnership with Holden Arboretum um, where we've been sampling buds of beech trees from across the state. All those counties in green we have sample sites in. Um, we send those buds to Holden Arboretum and they analyze the buds and try to detect the DNA of the nematode in those buds. And interestingly enough, um, even though we only see the beech leaf disease symptoms in the northeastern part of the state, we've detected DNA of the nematode from about half of our sample sites 
including several sites in southern and western and southwestern Ohio where there are no symptoms of beech leaf disease at this point that we're aware of. So it's really interesting, you know, we're learning that maybe the nematode is more widespread, but for some reason it's exploding its population in certain areas and starting to cause damage. So we're still still doing this sampling and trying to learn more about that. Um, we are focusing um, more on the ground visual surveys for the symptoms of beech leaf disease. Uh, in those counties sort of at the leading edge of where we know beech leaf disease to occur currently, this map is a little bit outdated. Some of those um, counties that aren't red are red now, but it's, it's fairly up to date. Um, but we are doing survey across the state as well. Um, and we have been using, I'll mention this again, but we've been using this Tree Health Survey app, which is a free app that's available for anyone to download. And it's, a, um, it's the preferred way that we're recommending folks to report potential sightings of beech leaf disease. And then our, our long-term monitoring plots. So we have um, about 20 of these currently established in Ohio. Other states are using this protocol as well, um, but it's just a, a fixed plot that we'll revisit and take some measurements to try to get a feel for the impacts that this disease is having um, on beech trees and on other forest species as well. So we'll continue tracking those over time to learn more about the damage that uh, that this issue is causing. How long does it take trees to decline and die? Um, how are other trees responding? That sort of thing. Um, so there are some other potential lookalikes to beech leaf disease that you might encounter. Um, one of those is caused by a native aphid um, that usually causes more of a yellowing of the leaves. And it also is associated with this um, sort of marginal curling of the leaf. And within that curl on the underside of the leaf is where the aphids are feeding for the most part. Um, so if you peel that leaf back, you might see the aphids or their, their uh, exoskeletons when they molt um, under that, that curled leaf. Um, but that's probably the most commonly encountered lookalike. There's also some mites that can produce these um, patches of different colors on the beech leaves as well. But don't let uncertainty of if it's beech leaf disease or not stop you from reporting it. And so um, you can download this app for Android or iPhone devices. If you search tree health survey, um, you can download that app and um, basically make reports pretty easily from your phone. Um, another option is just to contact us, myself, or the Vision of Forestry to make reports of, of where you might be seeing it. Um, so a lot of those northeastern Ohio counties, it's pretty widespread and easy to find on just about any beech tree. Um, but especially those fringe counties or other parts of the state, um, we'd be probably even more interested in, in getting possible reports since we don't necessarily know what occurs there yet. Um, so just to wrap up on beech leaf disease, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of unanswered questions. How is this nematode moving around? Um, it's possible that the nematode itself might come out of the leaf and move on the, the surface of the leaves or the, um, the twigs or branches. Uh, it's believed that they overwinter uh, in the bud. So sometime in the summer or fall, those nematodes or some of them are moving from the leaves into the buds and then spending the winter in that bud tissue. Uh, because as soon as that leaf starts to expand in the springtime, you can already see the symptoms and the striping on the leaves. And it's because those nematodes are already in there feeding on that leaf before it even expands from the bud. Um, so, and then as far as potential treatment options or management of this, we're still in the early stages of, of learning what, we, what might be effective. Um, there's been some, some studies and trials to look at different pesticides, and there hasn't been 
many promising findings other than um, there's a, a sort of fertilizer, I guess, a soil applied fertilizer treatment um, that's called polyphosphite 30. And some of the early trials of that, at least on small trees and saplings, um, show pretty good effectiveness at um, keeping trees healthy and keeping the, the damage symptoms from, from getting really severe. So there might be something to that. Um, that's gonna be an individual tree treatment technique, um, but those trials are being expanded and hopefully soon we'll have um, data and information to share about that. So maybe one potential treatment option uh, is, is gonna be you know, a possibility down the road. But um, aside from that, trying to minimize movement of infested material out of the woods where that tree was growing is, is a good recommendation to try to minimize inadvertent spread of the nematodes. But as far as how it moves around and spreads, it's possible the nematodes and or the eggs of the nematodes can get on um, mites or other insects and those can, you know, inadvertently hitch a ride on birds or larger organisms. So there are some potential pathways of this uh, nematode getting moved around the environment um, and possibly can be moved in rain splash or wind very short distances from neighboring tree to tree. Um, but still a lot of lot to learn about how it's moving those longer distances. So um, moving on now, I want to touch on hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, this is a small aphid-like insect native to Japan. So it, it's, it's very tiny um, and it attaches to the underside of hemlock needles where it uh, forms a woolly covering over its body that is most visible from October through the winter and into the spring until about June. Um, it's a lot, it's, it can be harder to see in mid to late summer and early fall. Um, so this is actually a good one to be on the lookout for this time of year. Um, and it was first detected in uh, Eastern North America in Virginia in the 1950s. And it was likely accidentally introduced on Asian hemlock trees that were imported for ornamental reasons. Um, this little insect, uh, it's quite prolific. There's two generations per year. With each generation, an individual adelgid can lay 100 eggs or more. Um, so it can really explode its populations and they reproduce asexually. So a single individual can get a, a new population started. It's been quite devastating, um, especially in the Southern Appalachians and clear up into New England. Um, but these are some photos from the Southern Appalachians and the Great Smoky Mountains where, you know, you've got thousands of acres of, of hemlock that have been killed um, by this pest. So it, it, it can vary in how long it takes a tree to die from HWA. Um, typically, the farther south you go, where there's more mild winters, um, there's greater survival of the insect in the wintertime. So the populations can can rapidly grow and trees can die in as little as four years. Um, but when you get farther north um, into New England or you know parts of Pennsylvania where the, the winters are a lot colder, um, we see a lot of mortality of the insects in the wintertime um, because of those cold temperatures. So trees can hang on a lot longer the farther north you go. Um, 15 years or more uh, before they're killed by HWA. So that's good news for us here in Ohio. We think it'll probably take at least 10 years uh, for a, a tree to be killed by HWA. So not a real fast tree killer like uh, emerald ash borer, for example, that can kill a tree in, in three or four years. And it's uh, it can be spread by wind. Um, it's a tiny insect that doesn't, doesn't fly. Um, so wind can blow them from tree to tree. Right when they hatch from the egg is the only life stage that they can crawl, the crawler stage. Um, and that happens in the springtime. So as birds are moving through these hemlock trees, they can you know, get 
crawler adelgids on them and fly for miles. And if, if any happen to drop off on another hemlock tree, they can get a new population started there. Um, human assisted movement. So there's certainly been cases of uh, accidental movement of HWA on landscape hemlock trees because they are pretty popular for planting uh, in yards um, for, for landscaping. Here is where HWA is known to occur. Um, those reddish brown counties are, are where they're established before 2022. The yellow counties are um, newly found infestations in 2022. So Ohio there is sort of situated on the, the western edge of the native range of eastern hemlock. And um, we're on that leading edge of HWA infestation as well. So we're starting to find it. Um, more and more. But uh, at this point, HWA is is pretty well established in probably more than half of the native range of eastern hemlock now. But clear from uh, Alabama up to Nova Scotia at this point. So eastern hemlocks are, are a really unique tree species. They're one of the longest living and, and most shade tolerant tree species that we have uh, in the eastern U.S. So they can live hundreds of years. Um, and they're, they create a unique forest type. Um, so they really, uh, with that dense shade, because they are so shade tolerant, um, that acidic leaf litter and the, the way that their shade cools the streams and aquatic systems really influence all the other species of plants and animals that are inhabiting that forest. So if we lose the hemlock trees, we could potentially be losing a lot of habitat that other organisms depend upon. Um, so the, the bird pictured here is black-throated green warblers, which um, really do utilize eastern hemlock forest quite a bit for breeding and foraging habitat. And um, you know, hemlock forests are also just um, tend to be really aesthetically pleasing and beautiful forest to be in. So that, that other photo there is Ash Cave in the Hocking Hills. Um, and so, you know, the Hocking Hills would look quite a bit different without those hemlock forests there that people love to come and recreate in. So this is where um, Eastern hemlock occurs in Ohio. Uh, this is the best mapping that we have. I think it probably underrepresents some of the more mixed hardwood hemlock forests that um, we have in Northeastern Ohio. But um, certainly where there's more hemlock uh, dominated stands um, in the Hocking Hills and Mohican area and Lake Catherine State Nature Preserve um, show up pretty well here on this map. Hmm. So in general, the eastern half of the state um, with a few interesting outlier populations, uh, for example, Clifton Gorge um, in the southwestern part of the state. Um, Looking specifically at HWA in Ohio, uh, we've now found HWA in 20 counties. Um, and these maps don't necessarily mean all the hemlock stands in these counties are infested. We've, it, we've just got at least one infested site um, in each of these counties. So the first finding um, was in, in Meigs County down in southeastern Ohio. Um, and since that time, we've, we've found it in more and more counties, um, including uh, some recent findings up in northeastern Ohio now. So what are we doing in, in response to HWA? So our goal here is to suppress the HWA population, um, try to protect the health of hemlock trees where we can. Um, eradication of this insect is not a, not a realistic goal at this point. But um, we do have some great tools that have been developed in other states that have been dealing with HWA for much longer than we have. So there are some really effective um, chemical treatments and in some high priority hemlock areas, we are doing chemical treatments to keep the hemlocks alive and healthy. Um, we're above 20,000 trees treated now at this point on state lands. And there's a, a, a few ways that those can be applied. Um, there's liquid soil application, bark spray application, or direct uh, trunk injection um, techniques to do that. And, and those all have their, their place and reasoning for why we might choose one um, 
application method over another. But the the one good thing about these treatments is that they're relatively inexpensive, the chemical cost. And with one treatment to a tree, it's protected for five to seven years against HWA. Um, so it's a it's a long lasting effect. Um, when we treat these trees. So we can we can get a lot treated and protected. Um, we don't recommend for folks that might have hemlocks on their land to start treating their hemlock trees until they know that they're infested with HWA. As I mentioned, it's a slow tree killer relatively. Um, and these treatments are highly effective. So if it's found on the trees, there's definitely time to act and get those trees protected. There are also um, a few biological controls that have been approved for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, there's a beetle species that's a predator of HWA, and there's also a, a fly species, a type of silver fly, whose um, larvae feed on HWA as well. So we're also using those where we can. That's viewed as a, a much more long-term uh, HWA suppression tool and the chemical controls are a much more short-term control to protect trees. Um, if, uh, if folks wanna learn more or wanna make a report of a potential HWA sighting, um, our website has more information and a reporting tool there to make those reports, ohiodnr.gov slash HWA. Um, also hosted on that website, you see that green button there is our ODNR Hemlock Conservation Plan. Um, so that outlines a lot more information of how we're going to approach treating this um, insect, how we're going to survey for it, do chemical and biological treatments, um, and other considerations in a lot more detail there. And part of that, too, was a prioritization um, to determine what our highest priority hemlock stands are in Ohio that we're going to focus on for treatment if we don't have the resources to treat all the, the hemlock areas where, where our focus will be. Um, I also wanted to mention another pest of eastern hemlock trees, another insect pest um, that is also native to Asia that probably isn't as well known as HWA, but it's a elongate hemlock scale. Um, it's also a uh, insect that has piercing sucking mouth parts, so it extracts um, plant juices and carbohydrates from the plant, um, and that's what causes its damage. But it will feed on other conifers in addition to hemlock, whereas hemlock woolly adelgid is specific to hemlock trees. Um, but I would say elongate hemlock scale does prefer hemlock trees. And it, it, uh, it's a tiny insect that forms sort of a waxy, hard scale uh, over its body. And you can see those pictured there. The, the male scales are white in color, and the females are more of a brownish color. Um, but they are more out on the needle blade itself, whereas HWA is, is right at the base of the needle. Um, and they have uh, also have multiple generations per year. They're becoming established in Northeast and the mid-Atlantic mid states that got cut off there, but uh, mid-Atlantic states. And similar to HWA, they cause sort of a slow general decline, um, but are capable of killing hemlock trees. Um, so I wanted to mention that because we have found that one also in northeastern Ohio, so another one to be aware of. And similar to, similarly to HWA, there are some effective um, insecticide treatments that can be done. Okay, moving on um, to a tree disease called oak wilt. So oak wilt is a fungus. Um, and its native range isn't totally known. Um, a, lot of, a lot of fungi are pretty difficult to determine where its native range might be, um, but there are some theories that uh, it could be native to Central America or possibly Asia. Um, so don't know that for sure, but probably not native uh, here to Eastern North America. Um, just a quick clarification, sometimes this disease gets confused with sudden oak death. Um, and I can certainly understand why, because oak wilt can cause the sudden death 
of oak trees. Um, but sudden oak death is actually the common name for uh, a different pathogen that, that causes issues um, to oaks and tan oaks out on the west coast of California and Oregon. Um, it hasn't been uh, found in the eastern U.S. Um, so that's that's good news. But uh, yeah, oak wilt is different from sudden oak death. But oak wilt grows within uh, the vascular system of oak trees, and it basically prevents the tree from being able to move water uh, up and down in its vascular system. And so um, it doesn't impact all oaks equally. Um, it's certainly more of an issue on oaks in the red oak group. Um, so oaks in the red oak group, they have uh, the pointed leaf lobes. Um, so things like northern red oak, pin oak, scarlet oak, black oak uh, are all in that red oak group. And uh, doesn't impact the white oak group, things like swamp white oak or uh, post oak or bur oak um, quite as much as the red oaks. It can infect white oaks, um, but it doesn't kill them as quickly as um, those in the red oak group. And the reason for that is um, red oaks do not form a certain type of um, vessel in their vascular system called tyloses. And because they don't have those, the, the fungus can grow really rapidly through its um, vascular system. Whereas white oaks have the tyloses and they kind of slow down the movement of the fungus in the, in the vascular system. And that's the same reason why white oaks are used for uh, wine barrels and bourbon barrels is because they have the tyloses and their wood is watertight. Um, whereas red oaks, um, if you try to make barrels, they would leak a lot more because they don't have the tyloses. So interestingly, it can also um, infect and rapidly kill Chinese chestnut. Um, chestnuts are uh, related to oaks. Um, they're in the same family. So oak wilt was first identified in 1944 and is now known to be present over much of the eastern U.S. Um, it's been known to be in Ohio since at least 1950. Um, the first location was, was somewhere east of Cleveland, so it's been here for quite a while. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not as devastating as something like emerald ash borer is for ash trees. It hasn't wiped out all of our oaks. Um, but it seems to pop up and come and go in certain areas. And it's kind of interesting that recently it seems to be increasing. At least we're hearing about cases of it more in the last few years. Um, so these are all the counties where oak wilt has been identified. This map is a few years old from 2017. <clears throat> But you can see that it's been found in most places in Ohio at this point, and um, probably pretty likely that it's been found in, in all Ohio, or it is in all Ohio counties, but just hasn't been reported from all of them yet. So how does this disease move around? Um, there's really two main modes of spread. So it can move below ground um, in that vascular system of trees. and um, trees of the same species or even sometimes in the same genus when their roots come in contact with each other underground they can kind of fuse together and almost share a common root system and we call that grafting when those roots grow together so if two red oaks have grafted roots underground that disease can move right through from one tree to the other uh, underground that way and this is a, just a photo of some excavated um, grafted roots that were, were dug up from underground. <clears throat> it can also move above ground. Um, so certain insect species, including uh, picnic beetles, which get attracted to um, sweet smelling things and, and sap of trees, um, they can get attracted to uh, the spores, a spore mat of oak wilt, and I'll show a photo of what that looks like, but they'll feed on that spore mat, and then if they move to another tree that maybe has a wound and has some weeping sap, they could get attracted to that and introduce the spores of oak wilt into an uninfected tree that way. And here's a, a photo of one of those picnic beetles. Um, so the damage symptoms uh, typically show up in early summer but then really throughout um, 
the second half of summer into fall is when you'll see these symptoms. But you get these leaf scorch symptoms, um, and it really kind of mimics drought stress. And it's because the tree can't move water from the roots up to the leaves. So that it really is sort of um, the effects of drought that it's experiencing. But uh, you get these leaves that um, turn this orange brown color, usually from the margins of the leaf inward. And um, then they start to drop from the tree in the summertime or early fall. So if you see that browning of the leaves, premature leaf drop, um, it might be oak wilt. Now, occasionally, this doesn't always occur, but sometimes under the bark, um, the, the next growing season after the tree has died, you'll get these um, spore mats that form, and they can sometimes push out, and, and they're called pressure pads sometimes, and they'll crack that outer bark. And if you peel that bark away, you can see the, the spore mat there. And that um, can be attracted to those beetles to feed on and where they pick up the spores and, and could move it to another tree. So um, with, with uh, red oaks, you get pretty quick death of the tree, usually within one growing season. Um, in white oaks, because of the tyloses in their, in their vessels, um, they can take two to three years to die from oak wilt. Um, so in a forest, because of that below ground spread through the grafted root systems, we often see these disease pockets, if you will, where um, the disease is moving out from that initial infected tree um, through the grafted roots underground. Um, just another photo of a symptomatic leaf that has fallen from a tree. And the, this tree um, is, a, is a mature red oak that died this year and it's it's dropped almost all of its leaves. Um, so, pr you know, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic and quick decline in those trees. Um, this is a, a row of trees along a driveway. I believe this was in the Chillicothe area, um, but you can see in this shot, um, this tree right here that was cut down the year before and there's some of the, the trunk left standing there, died of oak wilt and now this year, uh, we can see both trees on either side of it uh, likely had grafted roots underground and they're now starting to decline and, and drop those leaves because of oak wilt. Um, so something has to be done to stop that underground root spread to, to contain this. So another thing that's critical with oak wilt or identifying oak wilt is to get lab confirmation that you're dealing with oak wilt and it's not some other similar looking issue because there are some less serious issues of oak trees like um, leaf fungal pathogens like anthracnose that can cause browning and, and leaf drop. So it's really important to um, confirm that it's oak wilt because the steps needed to try to control it are can be pretty heavy handed approach. So you wanna make for sure uh, that you're dealing with oak wilt and not, not some other issue. So, to do that, we recommend working with um, Ohio State University's Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Uh, Purdue is also a good option to work with. But really what you wanna do is get some branch samples to the lab and they can identify the fungus and culture it out and grow it out and confirm that it is oak wilt. Um, so ideally you would get five to seven branches that are actively wilting. So not branches that are crispy and dead and have been dead for a while. Um, branches that have those leaves that are actively discoloring and starting to fall. Um, and usually about 10 to 12 inches long and a half inch to one and a half inches in diameter. So these are some photos of what these good branch samples look like. Um, and what they'll do in the lab, and this is something that you can look for in the field as well, is if you scrape away some of that thin bark uh, on the oak branch with a, a sharp knife, especially in red oaks, um, you can sometimes see this uh, sort of this dark speckling or streaking in that vascular cyst in that vascular tissue, and that's uh, a, a really good sign, not totally definitive, but a good sign that it could be oak wilt, um, and that's what they're looking for in the lab, and they can they can try to culture that fungus from these samples. So if 
you know, if you are dealing with oak wilt or there, it's it's an area where oak wilt is known to occur, um, it's a good recommendation to avoid pruning or otherwise damaging oaks during the growing season. Um, because if you are causing those wounds during the growing season, it's possible that you'll attract insects to them that might be carrying the oak wilt fungus. So we recommend doing any pruning of oaks during the dormant season, um, you know, in the winter time maybe. Uh, if, if that can't be avoided, this is about the only time that it's recommended to use a wound sealant, some sort of um, pruning paint or pruning sealant over that pruning wound to prevent um, insects from accessing that, that wound. Um, and you wanna do that really quickly after you make the, the pruning cut because these insects can show up within minutes. Um, they can really sniff out. They're really well connected to their host plants so they can, um, they can smell that, that wounded oak tree and show up pretty quickly. Um, so if oak wilt is confirmed uh, in a forested area, you gotta do something to stop that fungus from moving from root system to root system through that stand. So the tried and true method for containing oak wilt in forests is to use heavy equipment and machinery to basically slice a four foot deep uh, cut in the ground around those uh, infected trees to sever those root systems basically and stop the movement of the fungus. And then after that's done, you would remove all the oaks within that, um, that area that you've you've basically driven that uh that plow line around and treat the stumps with herbicide to try to kill those root systems and eliminate the fungus from the area and not only that any infected oak trees that are cut down so they don't form those spore pads they need to be debarked and split and dried or cut into lumber um, before the next growing season to eliminate the spores from forming the next year and insects potentially moving it from there. So this is a photo of, uh, it's called a vibratory plow attachment um, to a, a large kind of uh, ditch witch tractor. But this plow, um, you know, this is a four or five foot long blade that can slice through the soil basically and cut those roots. And uh, there's some publications that give recommendations on how and where to lay out those lines, um, trying to contain oak wilt. And you wanna buffer around those infected trees because it could be in trees that aren't showing symptoms yet. So you have to be a certain distance from your known infected trees or your symptomatic trees to try to make sure you're containing it. So one alternative that's being looked at recently and that we've um, been, been using in Ohio is uh, Basically, be, because that equipment is, is so hard to come by, it's, it's not many people have access to that equipment. It's expensive to do. Um, essentially, what we're doing is <clears throat> using those same containment lines and buffer area that you would drive and do that plowing. But instead of doing the plowing, we're intentionally killing those standing oak trees with uh, herbicide. So we're doing a, a double girdle cut around the trunk with uh, a chainsaw and then applying herbicide to those girdle cuts and looks like what you see in that photo there. And the idea is that you're trying to kill that tree, kill the root system, and if the root system is killed, that fungus won't be able to continue to move through the stand. Um, now, like I mentioned with any invasive, invasive species, the sooner you can act, the better. So, the quicker you can identify oak wilt in a stand, um, the much more, the better chances of success you'll have of containing it. If you catch it when it's only one, two, three trees, um, you're gonna have much more success containing that versus you know, a half acre of trees where it's gonna be really tough to um, do the work and not have continued movement of the fungus past those trees that you've treated. Um, and then there are uh, preventative fungicide treatments that can be done to protect oak trees, um, but these have to be done um, at least for red oaks before the fungus makes it into the tree. So it's gotta be preventative. And um, 
these are uh, trunk injections of a liquid fungicide, and that's what's shown there. And I believe these are effective uh, for two years. So this has to be done at least every other year. Um, and I imagine, I'm not sure on the pricing of this, but I imagine it's fairly expensive on a per tree basis. So if there's a really high value oak tree in a yard or a property that um, you know there's oak wilt in the near vicinity, you know, it might be worth doing these preventative treatments. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's probably cost prohibitive to, to do a lot of this on a lot of trees. Okay, and so recently um, we're, we're taking some efforts to try to increase education and awareness about oak wilt to natural resource professionals um, because it seems to be increasing in a lot of places in the state. So um, we're trying to do a better job of mapping where oak wilt occurs, um, get the information out to professionals on how to identify it, and then how to take action to manage it. So that's just some, some recent work we're doing there. Okay. I've got less than 10 minutes now, so I'm going to quickly wrap up with spotted lanternfly. This is a, a recently detected insect pest here in Ohio. It was first discovered in North America and southeastern Pennsylvania in 2014. It's now known to be in 14 states, so it's spread pretty quickly. It's a plant hopper insect native to Asia, yeah. um, and that's pictured here. This, <clears throat> these top two pictures are the adult spotted lanternfly. Um, at rest with the wings closed and then with the wings open. Um, and then down here are the, a couple stages of the nymphs, which are pretty small, you know, an eighth to a half inch in length. Um, but the, the young nymphs are black with white spots and the older nymphs um, are black and red with white spots. But those will be present in the springtime, like April to June, uh, and then maybe, uh, into July, you'll start to see the adults, which will be present until really into the fall to the first killing frost. Um, it lays egg masses on trees or other flat surfaces, and that's likely how it arrived here. Um, there's some thought that it may have been imported on decorative landscape stone directly from Asia, and it could have had uh, spotted lanternfly egg masses on it. But the egg masses are pretty cryptic, um, just sort of grayish in color. And they're covered with kind of this um, almost mud-like substance. And then over the winter time that, that wears away and you'll, you'll see these rows of eggs that become exposed. And then those hatch uh, into the nymphs in the springtime. They're a fairly large insect. The adults are about an inch long and colorful. Um, they have a lot of host plants that they'll feed on. Um, but it seems that their main favorite host trees are Tree of Heaven or Ailanthus altissima, which happens to be a pretty aggressive native or uh, non-native invasive plant here. So no, no problem with us with this species feeding on that tree. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem to do quite a lot of damage enough to kill Tree of Heaven. Um, but that is a great species to look for if you're looking for spotted lanternfly. So a lot of our surveys for spotted lanternfly focus on finding tree of heaven and then looking for the insect. Um, it also really likes grape. So that's what makes it an agricultural concern um, for vineyards and wine growing operations um, is the, they really do impact grape. And when they get pretty heavy, they can cause definite impacts to the yield and they can kill grape vines as well but they'll feed on a lot of different plants, um, including native plants. Um, the extent to which they'll be a much of a damaging agent to our native forest ecosystems is still being researched. It may not be that much of an issue for native uh, forest ecosystems, um, but certainly an agricultural threat um, for those, those vineyards. Um, this is where it's been been found at this point. So those blue counties are where infestations have been found. So we can see three counties here in Ohio, in eastern and northeastern Ohio. Um, and zooming in closer in Ohio, so we've got three counties that Ohio Department of Agriculture has under quarantine where they've identified reproducing populations of, eight, of spotted lanternfly, and that's Jefferson, Lorraine, and Cuyahoga. Um, but then there's been 
individual sightings of individual spotted lanternfly from a handful of other counties. And there's probably even more than is shown here. This is from September. I think there are even some more sightings after that time uh, this past fall. Um, so it's certainly increasing. And I think as time goes on, we're going to be finding it more and more in Ohio, unfortunately. Um, and then just to, to wrap up, wanted to just show this video, um, if I can get this to play. Don't know if, um, yeah, here we go. So this is a pretty heavy infestation on grapevines. This is from Pennsylvania, but um, wanted to show one odd behavior of spotted lanternfly. And you'll see, um, you can see my cursor, This see this, uh, liquid squirting out of the, the rear end of this spotted lanternfly that is the what's referred to as honeydew it's basically just their excrement um, but they produce a lot of that and it can drip down onto plants or any surface below them and uh, it then becomes colonized by a fungus called sooty mold which is sort of a black crusty fungus so that's another thing to look for with a heavy spotted lanternfly infestation is that sooty mold that's growing on their honeydew. So just a interesting thing to, to share there. And finally, just to wrap up, earlier detection equals more management options, which equals healthier forests. And I like to close on a slide showing some nice, beautiful native insects um, because Hopefully most insects you encounter out there are nothing to worry about. And uh, we like insects. There's just a few bad actors that we wanna be aware of and report if we find them. So thank you very much. If there's time, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Tom. All right, so I do have a few questions. Hopefully we can get, there's only three, but hopefully we can get through all of them. If not, if anyone has any more questions, I can always, get back to you and email Tom and send you an email with it, the answer. All right, so the first question I have, has any size class of beech trees larger than a sapling or pole been observed to have died from beech leaf disease? Yes, yes, there has. There, there have been um, larger trees and mature canopy trees that we have observed dying. Um, since they've been impacted by beech leaf disease. Um, you know, certainly beech leaf disease was, an, was a contributing factor in their death. Um, but, you know, it's hard to say for sure, did they get stressed by beech leaf disease and then, you know, drought or attack by some other fungus or insect ultimately, you know, helped kill the tree. But, but yeah, certainly um, we've seen some larger trees die from beech leaf disease, but um, not a whole lot and not as much as the, the smaller undertory story trees at this time. All right, the next question I have is should likely, like, bleh, likely species such as hemlock and viburnums um, not to be planted to help minimize the spread of these pest insects? So going with the, and then also, and should nursery owners not offer hemlocks or viburnums for sale? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for at least looking specifically at hemlock woolly adelgid, um, Ohio Department of Agriculture does have some quarantines in place. And so in those known infested counties, they've got um, nursery inspectors that inspect nurseries and they look for HWA but they're not supposed to be selling any of that material um, outside of the county. So that's hopefully limiting spread of, you know, inadvertent spread of those insects on landscape plants. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in general, it is good to think about what you're planting and the possibility of a, you know, invasive pest or insect or disease moving along with that tree. So. I think it might be good to try to, if possible, minimize um, use of some of those uh, plants in the landscape for that reason, because we do know that those pests can hitchhike along with those plants. It's not a bad idea. 
Okay. Um, I have another question. I believe this is about the oak quilt, um, just by the time, fr time frame when the question came in. It says, how quickly does the tree deteriorate and is this demise similar to the ash trees? Um, yeah, so with oak wilt, uh, like I mentioned, in red oaks, those trees die really fast, usually within a single year. Um, and so the quicker you can act to contain it, the better, because uh, if there are grafted roots there, that disease will continue to spread. <clears throat> um, and then with white oaks, it can take two to three years for trees to die from it. Um, but once the trees are killed, um, you know, they can they can stand for several years. I know ash get pretty brittle and can crack and come down within, you know, two or three years after they're dead. Oaks might last a little bit longer, but um, probably not a whole lot longer than that. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, an issue when you get oak wilt in there, killing a lot of trees can be a safety hazard. So addressing those trees as quickly as possible is always good. All right, I have a few more, but I'm just gonna ask you this one because I feel like it's probably most important. And and they wanna know, do you help private land property owners with management? So, um, and, Yes, so we can, uh, you know, the, we have a small staff, so there's only so much we can do. So we, we can certainly um, work with you to initially just identify if you have one of these, you know, uh, invasive pests of concern on your land, can definitely help with that. Um, and we can certainly provide you information and the, you know, technical documentation on how to go about and what we recommend doing treatments for. Um, sometimes in certain situations, uh, depending on, you know, the size of your property and what pest you're dealing with, there may be uh, federal cost share programs available to do management for it on your land. So I know um, we've done that to manage oak wilt on private lands. Um, but to determine that, we'd want to get in touch with the service forester that covers your county. Um, so on our Division of Forestry website, you can look up um, what service forester is covering your county. And they, that's, that's their whole job is to work with private landowners um, to manage their woodlands. Um, so depending on your situation, there might be programs available that can help. But yeah, we'd have to determine that on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, I believe at least I think Northeast Ohio. I think John King's our person. I believe, yeah, but I yes, don't count good, me. <laughs> yeah, he would be a very good contact. Okay. Um, I forget what exact counties he covers, but there are some other service foresters that do cover other northeastern Ohio counties. But um, John is probably their supervisor as well, so <laughs> he could certainly help. Yep. All righty. Thank you so much, Tom, for your time and sharing. I mean, it may be all bleak, but it's good stuff to know. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up and hopefully everyone has a good night and we can see everyone um, soon. Uh, all right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome.